I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And And this this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where we, Claire and Ashley, are reading a celebrity memoir and then searching through the pages to find one shred of information to tell you because it's not always there, but it's better that we read it first so you know. It's kind of like an Easter egg hunt where we're like, is there anything worth finding here? This week, debatable. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to do all of our show announcements in the middle because I have a suspicion that a lot of people are blasting through the beginning part because sometimes you guys will be like, oh my God, wait, but when are you doing a show in Austin? And I'll be like, we have been actively promoting a show in Austin for five months now. So you guys who listen up top, extra credit to you, okay? A star on your homework. A triple star on your homework because I appreciate that you stick Ashley, around Actually, stop being the good police. That's not fair. I gave them one star. You're giving them three stars. You weren't going to give them any until you heard me do it. Anyway, this is for you guys who listen up top. I'm going to do an emergency announcement in the middle of this episode. I don't know when and I don't know how, but I will be randomly interrupting us to do our show announcements for the people who don't listen at the beginning. And you guys can know ahead of time, skip on through. Nothing new is coming (laughs) because you guys did your homework. You guys get silent reading in the back of the class. The other people, they're up top pop quiz. (laughs) Okay, Claire. Mm Mm-hmm. If you were to write a memoir and you were titling last week's chapter, what would you call it? Oh, no. (laughs) My own decision-making skills. So as you guys know, we are going on tour, as you will know in the middle of this episode when I bring it back up again. We're going on tour, and so we have a kind of busy spring. And so I was going through my calendar, trying to get ahead of schedule, figure out what was coming up, just get my chickens in a row, get my ducks hatched or whatever. And I'm going through March, and I'm going through April. And what do I find on April? What? April 23rd, what's sitting right there first thing in the morning? Oh, that's the half marathon. The half marathon that I bullied everyone I knew into signing up for that at one point, the first day of the year, I was like, I'm going to run this thing in under two hours and I'm going to start training now. I was supposed to start training on January 3rd. I was supposed to run one mile. I tried three (laughs) times that week to run one mile. I never finished. So I put it on the back burner and I thought I might be stronger later. (laughs) No, you put it on the back burner and said, instead, I'm going to do 30 days of yoga and then start trying to run one mile. I was doing a lot of yoga, to be honest. And then what happened was I was banned from Equinox classes. (laughs) And that really threw me off my game. So I'm back into the Equinox. And then I finally looked it up and I was like, well, how many weeks do I have to this thing? Because I think a 12-week training program would be good. And it turns out I have nine weeks. So I've really got to fucking get cracking. And so today, right after this goddamn episode is over, I have to go run three miles. Wish me luck. I think I'm going to chronicle it on TikTok. Great idea. Because the other crazy thing is a lot of this training is going to have to happen in cities other than my own because we're out of town for like four straight weeks. I will be jigging through the streets of Dublin and then walking stiffly (laughs) through the streets of London. I have pretty firmly decided that this is going to be a half marathon, not a sprint for me. (laughs) I'm going to take my sweet time. I think if we mosey through, if, if I do mostly walking, that's just the name of the game, sweetheart. Ashley. Yes, Claire. If you were a celebrity and you had written a memoir last week, what would the name of your memoir be called? I would call it re-strategizing because I'm also going out of town a lot this spring and I've been trying to do a lot of work to like get ahead. And the problem is every time I get ahead, I think, oh, how nice. Now I have plenty of time to relax, but I don't. I don't have time to relax this week. I meal prepped. I tried to like have a bunch of food ready for myself and then I ate most of it upon prepping. So I'm not that far ahead on my meals. This book that we read for this week, I tried to read it on Saturday instead of the morning that we were going to record it, and I got way ahead, and then I finished after Claire because I was like, oh, I'm so far ahead that I can just relax, and I relaxed too long. There's so much that I've been doing to like get ahead, and then I forget that I'm not at the part that I needed to get ahead for yet. I really just need to re-strategize, and that I think has been a real theme throughout my week and, dare I say, life. You guys, this week we read One Day It'll All Make Sense by Common. One Day It'll All Make Sense. That's the name of his third album, right? So I guess that's kind of redundant. I mean, he loves that title. We'll get to it later, but he loves One Day It'll All Make Sense because this was the album title that he chose after he had to drop sense from his name. He was actually originally Common Sense and he had to drop it down to Common because he got sued. So he made the album title One Day It'll All Make Sense. That way he could still keep common sense. That's probably the most interesting story from this whole book, and I spoiled it right up top. So he was born March 13th, 1972. He is 50 years old at present, but this book was written in 2011, at which point he was 39. And the only interesting part of this whole book, I have to say, is whenever they interview and bring in blurbs from his mother, and the foreword is by her, Dr. Mahalia Ann Hines. And I have to say... 
if you're going to read this book, just read the parts by her because that's the only part <laughs> that's interesting. It's so funny. I just opened and she's like, have I always liked him? No. <laughs> So his mom writes the intro and she talks about how she loves her son and she's very proud of him and she wasn't always so sure of his career choices. But now she's like, no, it worked out pretty good. It's very funny, though, I will say to be like, I did not think this was a good idea when there was no future in it. And then I did think it was a good idea once he was very successful. (laughs) But even then, she still kind of questions it. So the way that this book is written is, have you ever seen one of those People magazine, like 10 fun facts you didn't know about me? And they write the 10 most boring facts you've ever heard. And it's like, I actually love a chocolate milkshake for breakfast. I went to sleepaway camp for 12 years. I could do a backflip. My best friend I met at summer school. That is how this book goes. Basically, there's no narrative arc here. And it's not very interesting or compelling to read. But every chapter opens with a letter to somebody. And then the chapter kind of explains the next phase of his life. Yeah, and how the person he's writing a letter to had a large role during that phase of his life. Or not. Or not always. Sometimes it just starts with that letter. (laughs) So it opens with a prologue. Dear reader, when I was 18 months old, my mother and I were kidnapped at gunpoint. My father held the gun. At least that's one side of the story. I will say that is both sides of the story. He goes, I first heard about it from my aunt. My mom told me one way. My dad told me another. But I can tell you both of the stories involve the dad kidnapping the mother and the 18-month-old at gunpoint. So basically what happened is his parents got divorced very early on. His dad struggled with a drug addiction and he would show up and demand to take the son and he tried to drive across the country with them. And his mother was able to escape by essentially drugging him. She asked for Advil and when he wasn't looking, dumped them all in a Coke and when he started to feel off, they went to a motel. When he fell asleep, she was able to run down and have the cops called. Nobody ended up being charged. The father spent one night in jail, but then kind of got off scot-free. But his mother got a restraining order against the dad, lived in Chicago with Common, and then Common's dad lived in Denver his whole life. In this intro, he goes into why he wrote this book, Do I Have Stories to Tell? We never really land on anything. It seems like no. There are stories in his life that could have been told. The way he writes is so uninteresting. It's so after school special. He like comes across like a real goody two shoes. I don't know. He's very cheesy in this book. First, I was reading it and I was just like, ugh, this is just boring. But by page 150, I was like, maybe this is annoying. And by the end, I was like, enough common. Why did you make me read this? So I do think that this book is boring. And I also think I would like to hear a lot of these stories from another perspective because I think that some of these stories start out interesting. And then whenever anything is too saucy, he just stops telling it. A lot of these stories just kind of end with no resolution just as they're ramping up and nothing ever really ramps. Like nothing really gathers too much tension. But every time there's a thread where you're like, oh, that could be a story, he talks about something else. So if you don't know, Common is considered a conscious rapper, which is like a subgenre of hip hop that It seems like every rapper also Yeah, we were Googling who else is a conscious rapper, and it was like Questlove. Talib Kweli. Kanye West. NWA. (laughs) Jay-Z. Kendrick Lamar. Anderson Pat. Like, who isn't a conscious rapper then? The list was long. (laughs) They said 50 Cent. At one point, they said Fort Minor. (laughs) If you guys were in high school when I was in high school, there's a blast from the past. I will say the difference between Common and the other conscious rappers is that Common is obsessed with the fact that he is a conscious rapper. So I do wonder if part of that branding that he's chosen to pursue makes it so that he has to like soften the blow of any story. But how it comes across in the book is he's just like, so then this huge thing happened and uh, the other day, it didn't matter. And you're like, okay, well then why are you telling me? There are a lot of things and he's like, and this is how I used to view these things like fatherhood and relationships, et cetera. And as a conscious rapper, here's how I view them now. And so I'm like, I think you could have showed some rougher edges and then talked about how you've changed since then. But instead, he lobs a pretty soft story and is like, and now I care even more. And you're like, okay. Do you care even more? So the first chapter is a letter to his mom and it's about love. He loves his mom. Him and his mom are best friends. I think that his mom is his best friend, but he's not her best friend. Oh, for sure. (laughs) And he opens it with these generalized letters. And I'm not going to get into all of them because they're pretty boring. But they're all very, actually a lot like the Heather Gay problem of vague, ambiguous, not specific, and trying to hide a lot of who he was. Danny Trejo is the perfect example of somebody who can be like, listen, maybe I did these things and maybe I didn't, but it's because of where I came from. I've changed. I did the best I could then. And now I have better opportunities, so I do better now. But so he's very sweet to her. Growing up, I just knew that you would always be there for me. I would look at my friends and see that they didn't have the same support. 
I saw how hard it was for them to not have a mother who could care the way you did. I knew then it was you who gave me a chance. I love getting to pray with you, Ma. Thank you so much for making me go to church, even when I tried to get out of it. Thank you for being my mother before you became my best friend. I often marvel at the strength of my mother's will with all the responsibilities she had to take on. Where did she find the strength to love so hard? Where does love like that come from? And then we get into his mom's first little insert, which again, his mom's inserts are the best part of this book. And I thought this was such a fascinating way to talk about raising children. Oh, by the way, his real name is Lonnie Rashid Lynn. He's named after his dad. Lonnie Lynn. Lonnie Lynn, who interestingly enough was 6'8". Yeah, that is really interesting to me, actually. I think being (laughs) 6'8 is hugely important. And he tried to be an NBA player. I think he got to play for one season, but he ended up addicted to drugs, got dropped down to the ABA, the American Basketball Association, and then from there got dropped again because of his struggle with addiction, which obviously colored the relationship he had with his now ex-wife and son. But anyway, so they call Common Rashid. I wanted him to be the kind of boy that would be a joy to raise, not just for me, but for someone else if I was taken from him. And she talks about always having this fear that she would be taken away. I raised Rashid in a way that if anything ever happened to me, someone would say, I'll take that child. I wanted him to be well-behaved, well-groomed, and well-nourished. So after she and Common were kidnapped when Rashid was 18 months old, she was then kidnapped by the dad a couple months later. That is just kind of skated over. They never really talk about that event, but I guess he came back for her. So she had this real fear inside of her that she was going to be taken away at any moment. And I think it's very interesting that she's like, no, he was going to be a good kid for anybody. It wasn't just our relationship. He had to stand on his own. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, 88th Street and Dorchester Avenues, 86th and Blackstone, 89th and Bennett, 87th and Stony Island in a black middle class neighborhood rubbing up against poverty. You had hardworking families and plenty of kids, but then you had gangbangers too. That's just the culture in Chicago, I guess. It's a city of hustlers, legal and illegal. And he talks a lot about how he was raised in a black community. And he's like, honestly, that's all I knew. Like there wasn't a sense of black kids versus white kids because everyone I knew was black. You had black bankers and lawyers and business people, but you also had black bums and hustlers and junkies. You had my mother, who was a teacher, a businesswoman, and later a principal. And you had my uncle, who was struggling with addiction. The point is, never in my life did I think that being black would help or hinder me in a way that I couldn't address with hard work. It just was. So he was born in Chicago. He was born ugly. His mom (laughs) talks about how ugly of a baby he was. No, his grandma did. His grandma went to see the baby and was like, boy, you were the ugliest little baby, all red and scrawny with a patch of hair right up at the front of your head. And you know what? You've just gotten better and better every day. Praise God. (laughs) It's so funny. I feel like it's nice that they were able to admit it because he did grow up to be handsome. I mean, he's really good looking now. Yeah. When he dated the mom in Never Have I Ever, I was like, good for you, mom. (laughs) Anyway, so he never really spent time with his dad until he was 10 or 11 years old. And his mom just one day was like, you're going to Denver to see your dad. And he got on a plane with his cousin. They went to go see him. And he started spending short periods of time with his dad. And even though he was nervous about it because of the stories he'd been told and the fact that he just didn't know this guy at that point, they ended up being really important periods of growth for him and also where he really discovered music. His dad had quite a record collection. And so he would listen to records with his dad. And then he started asking like, hey, when I go back to Chicago, can I bring some of these records? And then he just stole his dad's whole record collection based basically. In a cute way. Yeah, in a cute way. (laughs) Sorry, I'm only going back to his mom's inserts because I just find them so much more interesting. She talks about how she raised him. I was a disciplinarian. I was strict because I had to be. It's not easy to discipline a child, but if you're a parent, that's your job. Rashid was a good boy, but he was still punished. I just think that this is so interesting. I knew that raising a son without a father meant that I had to be strict at times. Nowadays, I often speak to groups of young mothers. They ask me, well, how are you able to raise your son the way you did? To begin with, I never liked him more than I liked me. I don't mean love. I loved him more than anything but I always liked me best. If you don't like yourself, it makes it very hard to like and to love your child. So when I was raising Rashid, there was no way that he could have three pairs of shoes if I only had two. And I'm the one working? That's not reasonable, mothers. How in the world do these young mothers go buy their child a designer something that costs $100 and you don't have savings account? You don't have a house. You live in an apartment. And then she goes on to say, like, you're not their friend. You're their parent. You can be friendly, but you are not their friend. That's so interesting. And she's like, you know, sometimes there were discussions and then there was me telling him things. And he knew if it was not a discussion, you don't talk back. Yeah. But I have never heard that before. Like, I liked me more. And that's why her part of the book is so much more interesting than his part of the book because she like has stances and says things. And I'm like, interesting. Meanwhile, he then tells some story about a bike that got stolen. His bike got stolen. And he said, I was disappointed, but I was most of all disappointed in myself for not standing up for something I believe in. Having a bike. <laughs> All of the stories, you start out and you're like, okay, fine, we'll ramp up soon. But every story is, as I said, not part of some larger narrative arc. 
And that's why when people say, oh, Madison Beer's book is going to be good. She's lived through stuff. It's not about living through stuff. It's about having perspective on the stuff you lived through. And a book is different than individual stories you hear at a dinner party. It's about can you write a narrative? So this other part of this chapter is, I think, not necessarily interesting, but does define something that could have been interesting, which is the way he views relationships. Mm -hmm. So he says that my father once told me, I think your mother loves me so much she hates me. Somehow that made perfect sense. For the longest time, I would measure how a woman felt about me, not just by the love they showed me, but also by how upset she would get at me. Pain was as good as pleasure. This feels a little armchair psychology of the selfish. I don't know that having not really seen them together ever, it feels like he's kind of searching for a way to diagnose the failure of some of his relationships. I feel that that's valid. I think that probably a lot of people fall into that. I think you learn relationships from the relationship you grew up with. And then I also think that that is a very common experience that people have, that they take the extremes for true love. The thing is, that is such a general kind of basic garden variety self-diagnosis that if he had started there and gone deeper, I would have been like, fine. But that's about as deep as we get. That's the last interesting piece of introspection we get in the whole book. And that is why it's not a very interesting book. Yeah. And I also just feel like he landed somewhere like, oh, well, my parents had a contentious relationship. So that's why I feel contentious relationships are. But like you said, that's actually quite common. I mean, my parents love each other a lot. And I have fallen into relationships from like, oh, the fact that we're screaming at each other means we care. That's not true. His next letter is to Emmett Till. And it's about the first time he ever saw his photo and what an effect that had on him. And he says, I will remember, I will continue to turn your death into a source of life. I will continue to live my life knowing yours is valuable and knowing I have to deliver something that will enhance the lives of others, especially children. Before I met you, all I knew is that I wanted to be a star. After that night, I knew that being a star would have to mean more than people knowing my name. It would mean a commitment to greatness, a commitment to memory. Then he goes into saying, for as long as I can remember, I've wanted to be a star. I still want to be, but now my purpose has more purpose. I, now I want to use my fame to provide more exposure for my art so that I can influence people's lives for the better. I've come to realize that being a star means illuminating God's light. Something I believe from reading all these memoirs is that everybody on earth could be a star and that so much of it is one, obviously like opportunity and luck and hard work and stuff. But I think such a big factor is like self-determination. Yeah. There is this bias where if you think you're going to be a star, if you have that delusion, you're going to be a star because so much of it is just continuing on no matter what. Well, I wouldn't say you're going to be a star because I think there are probably a lot of people who have that delusion, but they never became a star. So we just haven't read the book of the person who was so sure they'd be a star, but now just like isn't. Yeah, you're right. That's fair. I mean, he talks about Kanye. He says if Kanye hadn't become famous, he still would have been a person that people were drawn to. So then he talks about how he originally thought he would play basketball. His dad was a basketball player and everyone thought he was going to be a basketball player. And he just honestly doesn't seem like he was that good at it. My biggest pet peeve in the world is men telling you how good they were at baseball, basketball, whatever, until an injury took them out. They'll always be like, yeah, I was the starting pitcher. And then in seventh grade, and you're like, seventh grade? <laughs> I swear to fucking God, I can't even get into it. But he talks about how he was sure he was going to be an NBA player. And to the end of the book, he's like meeting other NBA players and being like, we played pickup basketball and I really held my own. I think I could have been in the NBA. He dropped out of basketball sophomore year of high school. After he wasn't even a starter anymore. He got his eyeball scratched, took six weeks off, and then couldn't earn his way back on the team. Can you imagine saying that you would have been in the NBA? He couldn't even get into high school varsity. I don't even want to waste you guys' times. He talks about how he was in Little League for baseball and he wasn't very good, but then he tried hard and then he was the star. Do you guys care about how good 12-year-olds are at baseball, especially if it's not a future baseball player? Of course not. It seems like he just stopped going to practice once he realized he wasn't going to make it back onto the starting lineup. His mom then writes a section about how he just doesn't have enough hustle. And that is very interesting. For all of Rashid's gifts, he doesn't really have that hustler's mentality. Perhaps it's because he never really had to hustle. He never had to face not knowing where he might get his next meal or where he was going to sleep. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's progress. But I can't help thinking that if it left him without a certain kind of equipment for living. In the last couple of years, Rashid's gotten better at balancing several things at once. He's had to, but I don't think he understands or even defines hustling the same way I do. He's one of the hardest workers I know, but a hustler? I'm not so sure. He's still got room to grow. He still has years and years to go. <laughs> I have to say, like, obviously, I don't love this book, but you have to give it to Common. He has a book. He's quite successful. And it's so funny for his mom to be like, he's just not a hustler. 
I find your perspective is very interesting, but I do wonder like how much more successful do you want him to be? Do you wish he had struggled worse so that he could be bigger? Well, it's interesting because that section also has a bit on code switching and how she would code switch on certain conversations. In her definition of hustling here, it's like really moving into any space that you could and making the most of it and really rising to the top of it in whatever way possible, not requiring that space to come to you. And I think Common has a stubbornness to him that we see in other chapters. She was like, well, if he had a business sense and like sensed what they wanted and then just been that person, he would be running a studio instead of auditioning at a studio. Well, she says earlier, here's my definition of hustling, knowing how to survive in a world that's set up for you to fail. That's why as black people, we've had to strive so hard to develop a hustler's instinct and pass it on to our children. You have a door closed in your face. You have to learn how to pick the lock or maybe just knock it off the hinges. And here's why I want her book, because I think that it's also really impressive that she was able to build him a world where he didn't have to hustle in that way. Like he was able to feel safety and feel loved and always have. I also think it's interesting. His father later says the reason he wasn't successful at basketball is because he didn't have the killer instinct. He didn't have that drive. And so I guess his parents do both agree that he doesn't have some sort of drive, but he is quite successful and they say he's a hard worker. I mean, my dad used to say that about me. He used to be like, the reason you're not better at soccer is you have no fire in the belly. And it's fucking (laughs) true. At the end of the day, I was always like, I don't know, man. I don't care that much about high school soccer. (laughs) I'm not going to let it ruin my day. That's how both of his parents feel about him. And yet, how do you deal with being overlooked or underestimated? How do you deal with being raw and unprepared? Do you sulk on the bench or do you force yourself to confront your weakness, to confront your self-doubts and the doubts of others and persevere? Time and time again in my life, I've had to face these situations, whether it was somebody in the music industry telling me that a conscious artist would never sell records or a casting director telling me that I wasn't going to be any good as an actor. These are the moments that call upon your faith in God and through God in yourself. These are the moments when you gain your definition. He also talks about having a teacher saying, Rashid, stop being a bumbler all your life and do something great. And that was something that really stuck with him. So he was actually a towel boy for the Bulls. I guess he knew a ton of NBA players because his dad had grown up in Chicago playing basketball and had been one of the guys who was at the top. He says he was friends with Michael Jordan, but it seems like he just kind of fist bumped Michael Jordan on his way through the locker room every game. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so one day he's delivering towels from the visitor's room to the laundry room on the other side of the stadium. And this was when the Bulls were still at Chicago Stadium. And so he had to go through this underground tunnel in order to get the towels to the other side. And he says the ghost of Emmett Till was in that tunnel with him. So I also want to quote this earlier in the chapter. He goes, I'm going to tell you something else. For as long as I can remember, I always felt that God was going to bless me and take care of me. I felt in my spirit that God had great things in store for me. I had a sense of destiny. He wanted me to do more. He wanted me to be, you have a purpose greater than just yourself. And I will say at this point in the book, I still thought we were really building. I thought that there was going to be like a great climax of a decision making, like what is he going to be? What is his purpose? Ever since that night, I felt the spirit of Emmett Till driving me, pushing me past all sorts of challenges, inspiring me to achieve. I believe that still to this day, gaining one's definition demands that we learn from others' experiences as well as our own. It means seeing yourself as part of a community, a family of faith, and even of history. And I understand that, but there was something odd about the use of it here. He also says, though, that when he was the towel boy, all the basketball players would give him their sneakers after the game. And he was like, I was a little hustler. I used that stuff to sometimes get demerits knocked off of my score at school. I'd give them to my teacher and he'd give me an extra point on my tests. And I was like, okay, that is why your mom thinks you're a terrible hustler. Because like literally Michael Jordan's rookie season shoes. And it wasn't even just him. Isaiah Thomas, Julius Irving, Magic Johnson, just throwing him shoes. And he would give them to his teacher for free. (laughs) You really do not have the hustler's mentality, you dummy. (laughs) So chapter three, the letter is to Pops. Hey, Pops, I was just thinking of you. We talked on the phone last night, but I just thought about you again today and what you mean to me. I don't know. It's always like cheesy. Yeah. There were times as a child when I felt you had abandoned me. What I see now are not excuses, but understanding. And that's because he now has a child that he doesn't see. He talks more about his dad struggling with addiction and getting through it. I feel like his dad put a lot on him. I remember him saying, your mother and I got divorced, but I never divorced you. A parent can never divorce a child. Then what happened? Why weren't you there? Son, can you understand what it's like to live so far away from your child and know that he has a life that doesn't involve you? I'm not saying it's an excuse, but can you understand? I guess I don't know what he wanted him to understand. I couldn't or I wouldn't. It took having my own child to understand. It took breaking up with her mother. It took living a thousand miles away from my child at times, too. I fight with myself knowing that I haven't always been the father I wanted to be. It was never for lack of love, but for lack of fight. I haven't fought at certain times to be around her. When he was seven, his mom remarried Ralph, who she's still with to this day. And he seems like a very responsible, kind, hardworking guy. 
And he never tried to take on the role of my father. I already had a father after all, but he was a male presence in my daily life and that mattered. And actually Ralph was the person who encouraged his mother to allow him to see his father because Ralph also had a child and he's like, listen, whatever your relationship with the dad, if he's sober, he should get to see his child. She also talks about the relationship she had with Ralph and how she met Ralph. It's so cute. I think he's a, quite a bit younger than her. And so she met him and was like, I need to set him up with someone. And her mom was like, keep him for yourself. And she was like, no, no, not for me. And then she got to know him a little better and called her mom and was like, I'm keeping him for myself. <laughs> Growing up, he also used to spend a lot of time in Cincinnati, which is where his cousins were from. And that's where he first wrapped something. He had a lot of formative experiences in Cincinnati. I feel like when you're younger and you go spend a summer with cousins, that's where all the memories happen. You could spend 11 months a year in Chicago and then you go to Cincinnati for a month and like every formative experience you've ever had happens there. Yeah, especially being like the kid from Chicago, he would hang out with his cousins in Cincinnati and he had like a lot of street cred. That was a much cooler place to be from. And all the girls in town responded to that as well. It's also where he first started freestyling. He would freestyle for his friends and they all thought it was great. And then they would memorize the lyrics and say it back to him. And that kind of gave him a real high of like, look at the effect I'm having on people. He had some sexual experiences that I don't want to get into because they're kind of gross. Yeah. He goes, I've always loved women. My first crush was probably my babysitter, Cherie. I'd cuddle up to her whenever I could, maybe even try to sneak a touch. He talks about like getting a boner sleeping over at his house one time. And then another time he kisses this girl who's his cousin's friend by kind of like blackmailing her. She walked in on him peeing by accident. And he was like, if you don't kiss me, I'm going to tell your mom. These are what I didn't want to get into. They're kind of gross. And then he's like, if you don't let me lay on top of you, I'm going to tell your mom. And so she lets him lay on top of him. And he kind of like dry humps her. And he's like, it didn't feel that good. But I knew it's what I wanted to be doing so I could brag about it. And then he tries to say, now you have to let my cousin do it too. And she's like, no. I don't know why he told this story. I like don't understand. Does he see it as cute? I don't know. It made me feel uncomfortable. And here's what I want to say before we get into this. I don't think Common treats women worse than any other man that we've read. He actually probably treats them better. A lot of the men we've read are like actual rapists. And I don't know that much about him, but none of this was like worse than anything else. But his whole thing is how well he treats women and the way he talks about them. You start out being kind of like, uh, okay. And then by the end, you're like, enough. Thou doth shout it out too much. I just don't know where there's an example of respect. He's like, I respect women so much that I fuck four or five of them a week. And I'm like, oh, yes. Yeah, I will say this one story was so funny to me. He talked about him and his friend thought that like the planetarium was a really good place to talk to girls, the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. So him and his friend would go there after school every day and then they would just like chat with girls. They're on school trips. But like there weren't always new girls at the planetarium. So like while they were waiting for a new girl to walk in, they would just read the exhibits and like walk through the exhibits. And he's like, I ended up learning a lot about space. (laughs) Yeah. So that was a cute, funny story. But then he was also telling you about like the first time he ever fingered a girl when he was 12. I know what a vagina feels like. I don't need you to explain that it was like mushy and gushy and weird. (laughs) I just like don't know what we were supposed to get out of that story. My attitude towards girls at that point was pretty simple. They were lips to kiss, shapes to touch, mysteries to solve. I was driven by physical desires that I only vaguely understood. In the moment with a girl, I can't say it always felt good, but I knew in the end that I'd have a story to tell. The story was key because it relieved the pressure you often felt as a young man among other young men, all pushing one another to get grown. Listen, I know that that is the truth. I know that like 14-year-old boys are gross and hooking up with girls and kissing and telling. But like as a man, why did you write that? Or why did you write it with no shame or like, ah, I cringe now, but back then I thought that was what it took to be a man. I don't know. There's no kind of couching it in I know better now language. And so when he comes back to school, he had carried with him this love for freestyle rapping. And so he was rapping at school all the time. And that started becoming his thing. That's how he was known. He was known as the guy who was always like freestyle rapping, which is personally never the person I liked the most. But I guess it was a hit here. <laughs> and it's interesting because two of his friends from school, Derek and Dion, they all work together to this day. Derek is still his manager. Dion is still producing. Dion goes by no ID, which is Dion backwards, which I love, actually. I actually did not even realize that. God did not give me ability to read backwards. Well, actually, no, you're not creative because if you were creative, you would have realized that Ashley, if you rearrange the letters, is Halsey. Is I know Halsey, that. Halsey, and our studio is actually off the Halsey stop, so you could have become an online artist known as Halsey. Should I change it right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try going by Halsey the comedian. <laughs> no, not that Halsey. A different one. Halsey the podcaster. So the next chapter is a letter to his friend, Seth, who passed away when they were, I think, in their 20s. 
I do think one thing that does come through in this book is that growing up where he grew up and with the kids that he knew, there was just so much death. Any childhood friend that he had then, if he can keep them, he will keep them. He is so close with so many of them to this day. And until they all passed away. This chapter starts out with a letter to Seth, but is a lot about the way that his friends and his friend group shaped him. It starts though with his time at high school. He went to a good public elementary school and then he went to Luther South, which is a private school. And I have to just real quick get this out of the way. In my prime, my game was like a poor man's Derek Rose or Rajon Rondo. I made dudes around me better, but when I had to take over, I took over. I could be fancy, but I was always in control. Again, he's talking about himself playing basketball. And then on the next page, my sophomore year, I suffered a serious injury and never played again. And then he quit by junior year. What do you mean you were like a poor man's Derek Rose? Shut. I cannot stand it. I'm so humiliated for men. I mean, it's like that Facebook thing to me. It was like, if you were in the inventor of Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. If you could have been in the NBA, you would have been in the NBA. Except for Michael Jordan, who you would have been like, he could have played any sport. I guess he wanted to. I guess the thing with Michael Jordan was he said to himself, I could have been in the MLB. And someone said, well, if you could have been in the MLB, why aren't you in the MLB? So then he became in the MLB. But then that's why I say I give him the credit <laughs> to say, like, I could have been a top tennis player. I go, sure. I actually believe you. <laughs> but Common, you are not Michael Jordan. <laughs> Anyway, so he had these really strong friendships. It was like a really close community. My friends helped teach me how to be a leader. And Chicago helped cultivate an authenticity in me like no place I could imagine. So him and his friends like would get into trouble and they would bop around town. They had little hustles and scams and stuff like that. He also talks about the way that having these little brushes with trouble set him back on the straight and narrow because he's like, that's not who I want to be. He realized that there were two paths that he could take and he didn't want to go down the path that a handful of his friends ended up taking where, you know, their lives ended early from shootings and things like that. I think it is very interesting how many memoirists we read about that have no friends. Some people dive into their childhood friends too much. Like, I actually didn't need to know this much about his friendships. He gives, like, 10 of his childhood friends entire chapters. It's really not that interesting. And that is not an accident that he's so close with his friends. His mother really made sure that he had friends. And the way she talks about his friendships is so interesting to me because she talks a lot about how she knew that you have until about 12 to give them a foundation of knowing right from wrong. And then at some point when a boy becomes a teenager, you really can't control them. And she's like, well, of course, when he's younger, you control who his friends are. But when he's 14, 15, you can't stop them from seeing stuff. It doesn't matter how safe you keep them at home or what neighborhood you put them in. They're going to be around trouble especially in the neighborhood they grew up in. And so you just have to like give them the foundation in order to make sure that he can save himself when the time comes. And she talks about she put a basketball hoop in their driveway growing up specifically so that all the kids would come to her house so that she could kind of vet them and keep an eye on them. But the time high school came around, Rashid had friends from all walks of life. Some, I'd later find out, were involved in gangs. But even if I knew then what I know now about some of these boys, I wouldn't have told him not to socialize with them. I never told Rashid he shouldn't hang out with this person or that person. That would have been the quickest way to get him to want to be with them. I believe in having lots of friends, all types of friends, but you need to know where they belong when you go through life. I simply told him to think carefully about where people fit into your life. You may have a lot of friends in the audience of your life, but not everyone can sit in the front row. There are some friends that you need to move down the balcony, some that you need to move out of the building altogether. You will try to change them because you care, but in most cases, you can't change people. You can still love them, though, but only from a distance. God, I would love her book. I know, right? I guess this is her book. She really stole the show. I also want to point out, he talks about in high school, the girls. Here are the lines that I'm like, I don't know, do you respect women? He talks about losing his virginity to a girl named Kamiko. And then he says, me and my boys were sex fanatics in high school. We'd go on sexual excursions looking for new girls. We were walking around hot from all that pent up energy, all of those hormones coursing through our veins. We'd find girls who felt the same and just humped you behind a bush, in a car, on a floor, standing up, whatever. I might be with four or five girls in a week. And this was all before I had a record deal. Yeah, he says he had more game in high school than he did as like a professional rapper. He and his friends got into a lot of trouble. They would just like run around town. In certain situations, we would get in a little bit of shooting sometimes. Nobody got killed or anything like that. But I've had guns pointed in my face. I've pulled a gun on someone else. That gun was a weapon of last resort for us, though. The first time I shot a gun was on my dude Dart's front porch. Dart was in the streets for real. and He was also a deep thinker. I wasn't a killer, but I guess I was out there doing certain things. I mean, the after school specialness of... Pretty serious situations is tough. Maybe things could have gone wrong. I'm going out and guys are shooting at us. I'm going out and guys are getting stabbed. I'm going out and something jumps off. It could have gone the wrong way. But I never said, fuck it, I'm just going to hang out on the corner and sell dope. I sometimes think about what would have happened if I hadn't been so driven, if I hadn't had been so fortunate to avoid the heavy cost of my heedless actions. At one point, his friend Seth, who this chapter is dedicated to, tells him, don't you see you're the leader. You may not want to be, but that's just how it is. And that's how it always will be. 
Think about what can happen if you step up and own it. And this is where it's really important to him to like start taking responsibility. I just don't know that he does. He calls himself a leader a handful of times, but I don't really see anywhere that he led. For all the dumb stuff I did, three things always brought me back. My dreams, my mother, and my faith in God. Don't get me wrong. I made more than my share of mistakes, but things never got too out of hand. I don't know. I think if a gun is getting shot, things have gone too far. It's all just kind of, uh uh-oh, we had a bad day and someone spent the night in jail, but it was never too bad and it all ended up fine. And you're like, okay, well, then why did you even tell us? And then he gives really bad history lessons. So he gives like a brief history of the music scene in Chicago. The Chicago blues were born. And then out of that blues tradition, you get Chicago soul. And then he actually says hip hop and rap was not popular in the 80s in Chicago. It was kind of coming out of New York, but it was sort of a new art form. And the way that he was freestyling, he was like one of the first ones of his friends to be doing that. He also takes his time to apologize for saying homophobic things in his music. Thank you. This letter is to younger me. Man, you a cool little dude, but you got a lot to learn. I like your style, though. I can see that you want to be an individual, to be unique. I don't know. He's so dorky. Yeah. So he goes to Florida A&M University. And at this point, the timeline, I think, is a little confusing because before he goes to college, he goes to the new music seminar in New York. And I think he tries to go the year before that as well. Yeah, the year before he doesn't get selected, but he gets to go with his friends who are selected. He has like a verse on one of their songs. Their stage time got cut in half, so he never got to the verse. And then he tries again next year and gets in as a solo artist. And this is in 1989. Did Will Smith do this as well? I think that that's where Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jeff both went. And like, I think they were also at the Marriott Marquis, right? Yeah. So they end up getting kicked out of their hotel. Okay, so here's what's interesting. His mom does not find out that he is a rapper until he drops out of college to pursue rapping full time. Because he got a record deal and he wants to ask her permission first. Right. So it's very interesting to me that she didn't know he went to New York to do this showcase. Sounds like there was a lot of things she didn't know about. <laughs> yeah. So he starts rapping under the name Black Poet Caden which just didn't really pop off. And then he starts going by common sense. And then before he like became famous, he got sued for being common sense. So he had to switch to common. I love this side about his time at FAMU. His mom would pay him for good grades. And so he took his grades very seriously. Every day I set aside a three hour period just for homework, no matter what else was going on. I'd be at my desk for those three hours and make sure all my work was done. And if his mom called, he wouldn't answer. And one time his friend Dion brought hot girls over and he was like, they can wait till homework time is over. He's such a dork. But he got straight A's. And this is wild. So Dion was back in Chicago making beats and they were friends. Dion would do the producing and Common would do the rapping. And when he went to college, Dion would record his beats to the outgoing message on his answering machine. I'd call in and compose my raps like that. Of course, I'd have to keep calling back over and over again so I could hear the track. It wasn't a perfect system, but it worked. That's how I composed a penny for my thoughts. That's so cute and old school. It's so cute. I can't believe it. I thought he was going to say they would like mail tapes back and forth. And I was like, well, I guess this is. That would have made more sense maybe. Faster. (laughs) Is it? (laughs) I don't know. He also makes a big point about never writing down his raps. He would just like listen to a beat and then go in and record something. So it seems like things just kind of were taking off. He was doing little gigs here and there. He would do showcases. And at showcases, somebody would see him and they liked him. Things used to work the way they should work. Now it's so much more confusing, but I feel like back in the day, there'd be an industry showcase and there'd actually be industry there, which is not true today. If anybody says I have an industry showcase for you, that is a guaranteed way to make sure you're performing for waitresses. (laughs) Do not pay to do an industry showcase. Even if you're selected for an industry showcase, you're not even paying for it. They're flying you out. There will not be industry there. I'm pretty sure that industry doesn't even go to new faces at JFL anymore. So he does this competition, Unsigned Hype, and he gets discovered. Unsigned Hype had launched Notorious B.I.G. and Mob Deep. They wanted to do a mixtape with Relativity Records that they were going to have him on. And they were like, do you know what? Let's actually just have you do a tape, not a group mixtape. And then that kind of fell through. But before he was allowed to do it, he had to go ask his mom. And she says, I was so disappointed, but more than that, I was confused. A record deal? A rap career? No one believes me when I say this, but I never knew Rashid was into rap. I knew that he breakdanced, but I thought he was just a fad. She's like, but at the end of the day, I knew how much not making it in the NBA had crushed his father. And he hadn't been happy since he was 15. So he's like, I had to allow my son to pursue this dream. And she says, I'll support you under the following conditions. That if in three years you aren't able to make enough of a living from rap to provide for yourself, you'll go back and finish school. Up until that point, you can count on Ralph and me to help you, but only for three years. But after that, you return to school and you can't come back here. You're a man now, Rashid, and I won't have any man but my husband living in my house. You got to be sick, dead, or dying before I can let you back home. We'll always be here for you, but it's time for you to do for yourself. 
That is a pretty generous offer. Three years of full support while you rap. I got to tell you, I know some kids who do comedy, some white kids who do comedy who are really uh, ridiculed for such a situation with their parents. Ridiculed by us. (laughs) (laughs) I knew a kid who said his parents were going to fully support him financially for two years while he tried to do stand-up comedy. Because it's basically grad school. And I was like, no, it's (laughs) not at all at grad school. You don't go into grad school and come out with less credential. (laughs) You don't go to grad school and come out with a gap in your resume. (laughs) So he makes his first record. He says he wasn't quite obsessed with it, but it was like pretty good. He says one of the big problems that as a young guy, he was full of mucus. Now he's vegan, so he doesn't drink milk anymore. But he's like, I was always stuffed up back then, which was tough stuff for a rapper. I was like, I could actually see that. I will never give up milk. I don't care. I'd rather this podcast fail. (laughs) Claire loves to phlegm into the mic to remind us how much milk she's drinking. He gets written up. It seems like bit by bit, you know, it wasn't smooth sailing to the top, but he says the ups and the downs were always trending up. Yeah. His mom goes to see him for the first time and she talks about, you know, watching him rap. The explicit content didn't bother me. I didn't like the word bitch at all. I used to tell him that when you use that word, it's like you're calling me out my name. He didn't do that much anyway. The other language, it was cool. You had to learn how to switch it. It wasn't the language used around here. It was a language for that particular field of entertainment. A couple of times, though, I'd think, oh, Lord. (laughs) His next letter is to hip hop in general. It's like, I used to love you and I still love you, but you've changed and I have to be okay with that because there's some new kids. It's just all very general, vague and goofy, honestly. I look back now at my younger self and I see a kid with great potential, but a lot of rough edges. I love you more than I can describe and I will always hold a high place for you in my heart. You are part of me forever. Love, Rashid. I mean, his road to success is not skyrockety. It's bouncy and windy and he didn't have any like specific setbacks but there were times when he thought you know what I don't know if I'm gonna really make it for a while I even thought about giving up and going back to school in Chicago to finish my degree but dreams of stardom still hovered in front of me just beyond my grasp sometimes they would be clear other times they would seem to fade away that's when I decided I'd forget about fame and focus on things I could control that's when I decided to dedicate myself completely to the art and this I do think is because he had people around him who cared about him and supported him. I think that even in your early 20s and early in your career, having the foresight to say, do you know what? In order to succeed, I need to double down and work harder on the art and like worry about honing my craft and not being a star. I think as much as it sounds like a no brainer, it isn't. We have read a lot of memoirs from people who their one and only goal was become extremely famous. And I think a lot of those people had no friends. And I think having friends helps clarify what you need in people because if you don't have people around you that support you, there is like a gaping hole in your heart that you think you can fill with fame. I also want to say, and the flip of that is, they weren't friends who supported him. They were like friends that he supported. He talks a lot about how in his early days, and the early days were like the first 15 years Everywhere he went, he brought an entourage of 15 to 20 guys. So when he went to do that unsigned hype contest in the Marriott Marquis, they got two hotel rooms and 15 boys stayed there. When he was opening for people for free, everybody would come to the green room. He was feeding everyone. Everybody was hanging out in the studio with him. He was like, if I make it, we all make it. He had more foresight and he seems very level-headed is because he has people that love him and keep him grounded. But I also think, as we said, Seth was like, you're the leader. He was like, okay, these are my boys and I have to make sure they're taken care of. I don't think it was just their support to him. No, no, it was definitely not just their support to him. But I just mean having people in your life is important. Here's a piece of advice to anybody out there working on their memoir. If you ever want to tell a story about a time you got too high and acted goofy, please don't. Alec Baldwin had a boring one about cocaine. Common has the most boring story about smoking weed and getting spooked and like having to get some fresh air. He had to call his dad. And his dad was like, just go for a walk, buddy. I, <laughs> if you were a hardcore addict and somebody called you and was like, I smoked too much weed, dad, and I'm scared, I'd be like, you bitch, I should have stuck around and raised you right. <laughs> Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if you smoke too much weed, you just sit quietly and wait. <laughs> he compares himself to Basquiat. As a rapper, I start a picture and I finish it. I don't think about art while I work. I try to think about life. And then, yeah, he's like, I never write down my raps. I work so hard on them. I'm like, all right, good for you, buddy. He says a lot of people go into the studio and they'll spit it once and be like, all right, first take, done. He's like, not me. I like to do it a hundred times. I wonder if a biographer would have spoken of his pretty privilege. (laughs) 
I feel like there's like a real element missing and I think it is that he's just like a good looking dude. I also think that a, a conversation on colorism might have been an interesting thing for him to speak on, but this isn't like a particularly deep book. Okay, so in the song, I Used to Love Her, which is one of his big hits and an ode to hip hop, there is a lyric where he says, then she broke to the West Coast and that was cool. In my mind, it was purely descriptive. I was talking about hip hop's life cycle and how the West Coast had really taken over by the early 1990s. So I guess Ice Cube took offense to it. I don't even get it. And I mean, there is East Coast versus West Coast rap, but he's like, I wasn't even in the East Coast versus West Coast because I was Chicago. So I like don't even know how I was in this fight. Ice Cube heard my song different and he put out a diss track. And then it was like a whole thing back and forth between them. Like he made a track about LA and everyone was like obsessed with Common's track. And then he put another verse on a song that was like, even in your town, they be loving my stuff. And I don't know. I guess it just over time, they were fine. Yeah, they were both in Barbershop too, I saw. They both did a song for the soundtrack. So I guess they made up. And then Tupac dies and Biggie dies. And he's like, what are we fighting about? I mean, it literally ends with, in the years since, I've crossed paths with Cube every so often. Now that I'm in the film industry too, it seems only natural that we should connect. That whole thing really got blown out of proportion. I'm just lucky that no one got hurt. Much worse things happened around that time. I'm glad neither of us became a martyr. What came down to it was making good music. It's so after school specially. Nothing amounts to anything. It all is just like, at the end of the day, we all went home and had soup. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you he eats a lot of soup in a turtleneck. Oh, of course. He's a vegan. He's oh, yeah. slurping down like a cucumber mist. So he talks more about coming up in the industry. He says that he hasn't really been around drugs that much. This line was insane. Since I've been in Hollywood, I've had friends and family members ask me about the celebrity drug culture and entertainment. To be honest, I don't see it. I know it exists, but it's not something people bring around me. What? Are you ever leaving your house? I don't do really drugs. And the amount of people that have like brought coke around me when I lived in LA and even here, I'm just like, there's a lot of drugs that I see constantly. If you don't think your friends are doing drugs, you're the drug doer. <laughs> He's just made a cocaine and he has no idea. I guess I'm just like, what do you mean you don't see it? You are lying. It's 1995. He talks about the OJ Simpson trial and the Million Man March. And again, I guess he literally was at the Million Man March, but it's just not written in a compelling way that it feels very desperate. It doesn't feel connected. It's just a lot of things randomly. It's the random backstory of this guy he grew up with. This is the backstory of what happened with OJ. Here's the backstory of the Million Man March. This book isn't that long, but you're like, how are we still reading this? The tension between these two historic moments played out within me as well. Here I was, a young man full of contradictions. I was a rapper with two albums who had built a name, but I wasn't exactly a superstar. I was still a knucklehead doing what knuckleheads do, but I had a dawning sense of my greater purpose. What does that have to do with the O.J. Simpson trial? I don't know. And how is it a contradiction to be like, I'd put out two records, but I wasn't a star. That's not a contradiction. It's just like a path. A path. And then the other thing is that the idea of a sense of purpose is brought up so many times. And I'm not going to spoil it yet, but later I'm going to read you the last paragraph of the epilogue. This purpose, is it in the room with us right now? I don't know what you're talking well, about. Well, I thought it was very interesting when he was talking about earlier how he has a bigger sense of purpose now. He's like, and my purpose is to make music so more people can hear it and more people can be touched by my light. And I was like, okay, I don't really know how that purpose is different than being famous. Then he talks about how he stopped drinking. I didn't stop drinking all at once. I wasn't scared straight or anything. There were times in the months that followed when I would drink so much that I would wake up the next morning and couldn't quite remember. So he slowly stops drinking over a period of time. And this comes from a rock bottom that clearly wasn't a rock bottom where he like gets into a fender bender because he was drunk driving. But the guy comes out and recognizes him as common and is like, hey, don't worry about it. We'll go on our merry way. And then he pays for the repairs. And so that's when I realized I should stop drinking. It did take me a couple of years to stop drinking. But that was a big night where I said, oh, I should probably stop. And I was like, why are you telling me this? What are we building towards? Then he writes a letter. This is where I think I actually turned on him. <laughs> this is, I think, the exact moment where I said, common enough. He writes a letter to an unborn cellular mass. So he had a girlfriend who got an abortion. So he has a daughter today, of course, and he barely parented her, it seems. But now he's writing this story to his unborn child that he regrets aborting, even though if he went back in time, he wouldn't have done anything differently. I actually do think this line was poignant. I just don't want to hear it from him. There's a tough emotional space to inhibit living with deep regret that you wouldn't undo if given the chance. I think abortion is a really tough issue where sometimes you're like, we shouldn't have had that baby, but I also... Wish I hadn't have had an abortion. Yeah. Yes. I think that it's interesting, just not from him. 
No, and also it's not interesting coming on the tail end of a letter writing to this like abortion mass clump being like, who would you have been? Would you have been funny? Would you have been a young woman? You wouldn't have been anything. You're a clump. It felt very pro-lifey, like he regretted it. And I did not like the vibe. And then for him to be like, anyway, I respect women so much. I mean, he has a child a few years after this abortion that he was missing for a large part of her childhood. He just wasn't available to parent. And it's like, okay, so... You obviously weren't ready then. You weren't even ready later when you thought you were ready. And you had the option to opt out. And I don't think there's really any consideration for the woman in this situation. The same year that his daughter was born, I wrote and recorded Retrospect for Life with Lauren Hill as a testament to so many young people like us faced with the decision of life. I dedicated the song to my baby daughter who was born in 1997. I find it very grotesque that when a child is being born that needs your time and attention and care and love, you're like, uh, you know who I miss? That other baby that I wouldn't have raised. Yeah, I'm going to go spend time in the studio thinking about that instead of here with you. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't love it. And he was like, you know, men have to step up and have these conversations and support women going through it. But I'm like, not in the way you're doing it. Something about the way he did it, I just found very icky. So at one point, Kim, the woman that he has a child with, moves to Washington, D.C. and does not leave her address. Like this relationship was much more contentious than he's letting us believe. You do not leave with a child and not say where you're going. She would talk to Common's mom all the time and she was aware of where they were. She did not want Common to know where she was. And so I'm like, okay, this relationship was contentious. Something was happening here that you're refusing to tell us and it's making me not trust you a lot. It's a challenge, though, to be there even when I'm not. For most of Amoya's life, I've been on the road, whether touring or more recently making movies. No matter how far apart we are, she's still the first thing on my mind in the morning and the last thing at night. We have a bond that doesn't care about distance. There's so little in this book that it's hard to really get to know common, but it did sort of clarify a lot of things from other books for me. And it is men's ability to forgive themselves. Yes. (laughs) It's so fascinating. The reason it all feels so like light and done and dusted is because they've said, this is my past. I forgive me for it. Regardless of who else was involved, I've come to terms with the person I was and the person I am now. And you're like, okay, but who was that person really? Because I know the version of you that now exists post forgiveness of yourself. And that's who we're reading. What really happened? Having a daughter has made me understand people better, particularly women. I began to consider and question how any woman I was dealing with might have been raised. Did she have a father in her life? What was she missing? What helped her move forward? Think about all that makes me want to make sure that I give all that I can to my daughter. Not your presence, not your attention. I don't like that he's like, wow, did you have a dad growing up? Because my daughter does. (laughs) He loves to talk about what a good person he is. This is another story that I find surprisingly honest in that it's not flattering. He's talking about a show. They went to a hotel afterwards. They had a party at their hotel and they invited a ton of girls to the party. And then a guy shows up with two of the girls that were invited and they're like, oh, no, you're not invited. And he's like, no, I came with these girls. And he's like, yeah, the girls are invited. You're a boy. You're not invited. So he is like, "Okay, well, this is whack. I hate it here. And then Common overhears himself being called whack and tries to fight this guy. And then his friends jump in and beat the shit out of this guy. And Common is like, anyway, we had to do it. And for years, people talked about how we beat the shit out of that guy. And this was another story where I was like, is this a huge press point that you're trying to explain and downplay? Or is this just like a random story that had no bigger point? You can never really tell why he's telling you anything. You can never really tell. But the fact that he still thinks he's the reasonable person in this story re-clarifies a lot of the previous chapters. Well, I would love to read an excerpt from this letter that his mother wrote to him, a letter to my son from Dr. Hines in 1997. So this is the year that his daughter was born. And she talks about what a man is. And a man makes decisions and sticks to them. Be a chess player, not a chess piece. You can't keep calling your boyhood friends for advice, especially when their lives are a mess. Make your own decisions and stick to them. And then she talks about the responsibility of a man and what a good man is. A man stands for something. A man takes care of his responsibilities. I know you know these things about yourself, but knowing is not enough. It's time to change. I know you can. You are Lonnie's child, but only by birth. It is how you were raised that determines what you are. You are God's child and you need to start acting that way. You were raised by a strong black Christian woman and a man. You've seen Ralph and me work hard all of our life and take care of ourselves and others. You have a model. Even Lonnie is a model for you. He's made the mistakes that you don't need to make unless you want to be as unhappy as he was. Believe me, he has not been happy since he was about 15 years old. Rashid, it's time for you to stand up and be a man. This means not saying you're a man, but acting like you're a man. 
Behavior is a mirror in which everyone shows his image. Oof. Scathing. Everything that she writes is so much fucking better than everything that he writes. It's incredible. I mean, that is the letter that I was like, I have to shape up. It was calm. It was collected. It was such a strong like plea from an adult to an adult to say, be the person I know you can be. I mean, it's a good fucking letter. I'll put it on Instagram. If you need somebody to like kind of slap you in the face and be like, shape up. Yeah. This is the letter that's gonna be like, I have to look in the mirror and ask myself, who am I? Who do I want to be? And who do I say I am? And how am I actually acting? (laughs) One day it'll all make sense is expressed visually by that photo of me and my mother on the CD cover. Parenting, love, life, responsibility. My soul was saying, I got to grow. I have to contribute something. I can utilize my music to say something to help somebody's life. I can talk about God, about love, about my experiences. If you listen to my music before then, you don't hear a lot of substance to it. The thing is, he like poses himself in this place of being a leader, of learning, of changing, of growing. I just don't know if it is real or if it's what he thinks of himself. It's just also vague. I've always been a seeker. I've always sought out knowledge. I read books. I go to temples. Okay, so then he's feeling really unsatisfied on his label, and he calls his dad to be like, can you get me out of my record contract? And his dad goes into his record label's office and just says, I'm here to talk to the CEO. He says the general manager, which I don't think is a thing at a record label. But he waits all day, and he finally gets a meeting with him. And when they sit down, he goes, let me ask you a question. If your son wanted to get free and he couldn't, how would you feel? I know for a fact that you would not let me suffocate your son. Well, I won't let you suffocate mine. Mr. Lin, this is business. Don't hurt my son. Don't hurt my son. Don't hurt my son. He said it three times. Each time he looked him dead in the eyes. He wasn't threatening him. He knew that guys like him understand when they're being threatened. Dad was respecting him and demanding that same respect in return. I'm coming to you as a man. I'm asking you as a man to do the right thing. A few weeks later, the label granted my release. No way is that how it happened. Well, we we skipped an important line. Look, I got as much juice as you. I've got partners up in Harlem on 145th and St. Nicholas who have my back, but I'm coming to you as a man. So there's, I'm coming to you as a man, but if you don't, I'll come to you with somebody who has weapons. So he got out of his record deal. The next chapter is to JD, a friend of his who died from actually a rare blood cancer, who worked with him and helped produce with him. Yeah, so he talks about coming up in New York. He moved to New York in 1998, expecting to stay for a few weeks. He stayed for months, and it changed who he was. He got to wear goofy clothes these times. (laughs) Yeah, he got to really develop his sense of style because in New York, people weren't as mean to you as they are in Chicago when you wear something silly. New York means more to Rashid than clothes, though, his mom writes. I think it meant liberation, too. (laughs) (laughs) So then he talks about his friend JD, who was a genius. He talks about recording his albums and he was in the same studios as D'Angelo and Questlove. And that is a great lineup. And he was like, it was a lot of hanging out and collaborating. They called themselves the Soulquarians because the other two were Aquarians. (laughs) (laughs) He loves astrology. He loves astrology back in the 90s. And then he gets into an explanation of the American relationship with Cuba. And I'm like, okay, buddy, this is not what we came for. And you're not doing a good job. So he's like putting out albums. He puts out I think his biggest commercial success of an album, like Water for Chocolate. And this is in 2000. And so he's on tour, touring this. And he goes, by the time I got a little fame, the opportunities for sex expanded, but the chance for love contracted. I think that's why a lot of celebrities fall into sexual addictions. Sex is so readily available that you gorge on it. I certainly have my share of fun. Okay, here we go. On tour, I'm always most interested in talking to the girls who don't seek out attention. My people know this. If a crew of girls comes backstage, my guy will pick out the one who's most likely to get overlooked. The one who's to this or to that. Maybe it's the sister who's been waiting forever to meet me, who may not be considered conventionally beautiful. That's the one I want to see. I see the inner beauty in all women. When women come backstage, I treat them with respect. Most of them only want to talk. They might think they want something more, but in the end, the best thing that can come is a little human connection. Okay, I love the idea of treating women with respect by sending out your henchmen to go pick out the ugliest one (laughs) and do her a favor. You don't have to sit here and pat yourself on the back for being respectful and being like, anyway, when I fuck a groupie, it's one with a funny mole. (laughs) When I fuck a groupie, it's the one that maybe wouldn't have gotten fucked otherwise. I want to give her a chance. And then he says this that makes me so mad. When it comes to women I've been with in my life, I always wanted them to enrich me in some way. If we had sex and you weren't bringing anything to my life, that would be the end of things. But if you were bringing new experiences to me, play new music, art, whatever, then I was turned on. Okay, so then he says, I always look for a woman who's been through something, who has struggled. I wanted a woman who has known pain because I feel like that's the thing that builds true character. They know what it is to carry pain, so they're prepared for challenging situations. They can support you. I also want women that are strong. I can't deal with a woman who's been sheltered all life. I want a strong woman with intelligence, but a sweet thing too. I want, and I still want, a woman who's spiritually wise, culturally smart, academically adept, and naturally streetwise. 
who will mother me like my mother and also has been broken down. And he's like, I respect women. I only want a perfect one. Yeah, he spends a lot of time in this book only really talking about women either theoretically or when he gets into a specific woman, a woman that he like dated and respects. It's because she's famous. We get like a couple paragraphs on Kim, the mother of his child who ran away from him and didn't leave a forwarding address. And then the next chapter is a letter to the love of his life, Erica Badu, which... Good choice. I mean, if you're only going to love one, it should be Erica Badu. She's the love of a lot of people's lives, I think. (laughs) So you were the first woman I had ever been in love with as an adult. We met when you were pregnant at the same time as Kim. That's when they met. They met because they all bonded because she was with Andre 3000 and she was pregnant at the same time as Common's baby mama. And I'm just like, that is a funny time to be falling in love with somebody else who is not the mother of your child. Yeah. I also think that honestly, even if this is true, it's just kind of a mean thing to write when you have a baby with somebody. Me too. This is not a particularly open and honest and call outy book. Not everything needed to be said. If he was going to really wrestle with these emotions of what it was like to be expecting a child and like preparing to make a family with one person and then falling in love with someone else, sure. But instead, he just kind of disregards that he was even in a relationship. So then he talks about getting together with Erica Badu. So they get together in the wake of her breaking up with Andre 3000. He's like, a lot of people thought that was sketchy, but I just happened to be there for her when she called. And then he's like, I really didn't like that. His face was all over her apartment, though. So her house was covered in, you know, pictures of the father of her baby, Seven. But he loved her. I had never loved anybody as much as I loved her. The way I love is so deep and uninhibited that I have a tendency to lose perspective. Okay, so here is something that I find to just be not reflective. Erica was my first grown-up love. Loving her was the first time I'd ever been so caught up in the relationship that everything else seemed muffled and dimmed. This actually does not sound like adult love to me. It sounds like teenage love. I think adult love is being able to love someone and also maintaining a sense of self. And then four months in, he proposes to her. The thing is, none of his friends really like her. He moves down to Dallas to be with her. He goes vegan to be with her. And everyone's like, dude, you're like losing yourself. And he even says that if he had to go into the studio and record an album and she was like, no, you have to clean up the house. He's like, I was just cleaning up the house because she had asked me to. And I'm like, that's kind of funny. (laughs) Yeah. For all that was good about our relationship, there was a lot that was difficult. Maybe I should have seen the signs. I loved Erica so hard. I didn't have any love left for myself. And then he starts kind of trying to reestablish his own life. And as soon as he does that, she's like, oh, I love someone else now. Bye. She literally calls him in a hotel and is like, sorry, I've moved on. I don't like you anymore. He could hear her with her new boyfriend in the background. But I want to read what his mom said. That time with Erica was interesting. I think that was truly his first love. She invited us all out to Dallas once. She wanted our family to come meet her family. I really liked Erica. Even though his little heart got broken, she was sort of responsible for teaching him, particularly about his health. They were strictly vegans. I said, Lord, he was walking in them sandals wearing smocks. <laughs> <laughs> something because like all of his friends made fun of him for like wearing dresses and Mew Mews and that like whatever that made me chuckle. But something about the word smocks, <laughs> like a preschool teacher. <laughs> Whenever his mom writes, oh, Lord, it makes me laugh. They're still in touch. She's still in touch with Erica. Yeah. She goes, that was part of the problem. Rashid probably would have been a good person for her, but she was so lost herself at that time. That was part of the problem. I'm never shocked by what Erica does. She's a person who's brave, and bravery sometimes can look like foolhardiness. When I was with Erica, I held myself back. Something magical happened after we broke up. Out of my grief at losing the relationship, I found a way to reshape myself as a man. I started owning my excellence and the recognition that came with it. It helped that Kanye was around at the time because his confidence bolstered mine. Seeing someone so uninhibited about his art was an inspiration. I will say every story I've heard about early Kanye is that like from day one, he was just very sure that people should be listening to him. And supposedly he was not good at the beginning. Supposedly he had a lot of rough edges and he just was so sure of himself at all times. Like that's the one thing I always hear about him. And I do want to disclaim that this book was written in 2011. So he had had some moments, but the moments had not been publicly considered crossing the line. The people I look up to the most, Nelson Mandela, Muhammad Ali, Barack Obama, Harry Belafonte, they're all what I call humble kings. They wear their greatness like Jesus wore it. Jesus knew that he was the son of God, the Messiah, but he still kept his humility. So many of the greats carry themselves as humble kings and queens. Okay, God bless Common, right? I have nothing against him personally. I do think he like puts himself in the line of these people. And I don't know that he is there that great. I do think he sees himself as being like Nelson Mandela, Muhammad Ali, Common. (laughs) The next chapter is The Letter to Kanye, and this is about their work together coming up as two Chicago rappers. This is so funny. So he starts it off saying, I always love that story about the prince who trades places with the popper. 
He exchanges his robe for rags. He leaves the palace for a shock. He lives life down on the ground. Then at the end, when he resumes his rightful place in the kingdom, he's better and wiser for his experiences and his struggles. In 2000, I was a prince in the rap game. And then he talks about getting into acting as being like his time as a popper so that he can, I guess, return back to the top and be a better ruler. I'm just like, oh, okay. Yeah. The thing about him having humility, I don't know that I see it. He really does think he's Michael Jordan. I love what it takes to achieve great things. I'm not afraid to work for it. I thrive on the slow progress born of struggle. Those are vital aspects of what motivates my life and gives me a sense of purpose. I've always thought of myself as an artist first and foremost, and an artist creates beautiful things regardless of the art form. What's to say that I can't become a painter or a sculptor or a pianist if I haven't tried? Who's to say that I couldn't make myself into an actor? I just think that those are really different things. Yeah, I mean, nobody's to say it, but good luck. Go for it. Try it out. So he does. He auditions. His first audition goes poorly, and then he gives it his all, and he gets the role in Smoke and Aces. He has a hard time finding roles that appeal to him. He has a really great conversation with Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman, who both taught him stuff. Denzel taught him, you have to like trust yourself, man. You know how to read these lines better than whoever wrote them. You know how we would say this. So say it like that. We doing something that's expressing something we express as black people. So you'll know how to say it better than any screenwriter can tell you. And then Morgan Freeman gave him the advice of don't try so hard. You have to like live in the scene. I know you've studied these lines, but you can't try to do them as good as you did them alone in your room. You have to exist in the moment. He also is obsessed with Angelina Jolie. She's the realest person I've ever met in any industry. And then he talks about how great Queen Latifah was, who gave him his first real opportunity as like a leading man. And this made me realize I would love an updated Queen Latifah book. Yeah. So I looked into it. Queen Latifah has a memoir that came out in 1998. So let me know in the comments if you would like that or if we're waiting for her to do a new one. Because I feel like if she did a first one, she'll do a second one. 1998, that's pretty old. That's 25 years old. I just don't know if we would get any of the references at this point. I feel like I'm a better actor when there's some drama. I'm better with some weight. Then, too, I don't like playing the good guy because I play the good guy every day in real life. He's such a good guy. He's such a good guy. I remember when he fucked the ugly girls at the concert. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say, this is one of my pet peeves from people who are medium okay at acting is when they're like, I just do better when there's drama. And it's like, okay, then that means you're not that good at acting. Being like, oh, I need meat in the scene in order to act it good. A good actor can act lots of things good. Okay, so his mom has to say, he needs to grow in all areas as an actor. I want him to be able to do comedy, drama, action, gangster roles. I think he's going to become good at dramatic roles. The biggest thing with Rashid is that God has given him some gifts. He says it, but he doesn't really believe it. Not yet. I think he's more than what he thinks he is, and I don't think he thinks it yet. I guess that's better than the opposite. I want him to stay the way he is, stay humble. But then it's just a funny for her to be like, mm, you'll get there. He starts dating Taraji P. Henson, our fave. It just didn't really work out, though. I think it was over before it began. Taraji was his mom's favorite girlfriend, though. Taraji was the one I truly, truly loved. I never even told Rashid until after they'd already broken up. I knew from the start that he wouldn't stay with Taraji. It was because he was going through a career change. His friend was dying of a rare blood disease. It just was not really a good time. He was still heartbroken over Erica Badu. He talks about meeting Kanye. Kanye was cocky as hell, but you had to love him. He could be like a mosquito in your ear, though. Straight get on your nerves. My guys used to come to the studio and Kanye would be talking nonstop. We got to beat his tail, they'd say. Nah, cool out. He's good. It's just interesting to see how far Kanye has come is amazing and great for the shy. It's great for all of us. Yes, he's found himself in the middle of controversy, but it's no different from what he used to do in Dion's basement. It's just now that the spotlights are on. I may not agree with everything he does, but I support him unconditionally and love him. Okay, so where it gets interesting, of course, is when his mom tells her side of the story because she became very good friends with Donda. Donda West. They were best friends. It was so sad when she passed. We talked a lot before she had the surgery. I did not want her to do it. She didn't need to do it. She was beautiful. She was smart. I told her one time, why don't you come back from L.A.? And she talks really about how she thinks L.A. kind of like... She wouldn't have wanted plastic surgery if she didn't live out in L.A. I try to stay in touch with Kanye too, but he's sort of hard to reach sometimes. He's just hurting. He's a much better person than he's been portrayed to be. You can't even begin to know. That boy's heart is so good, but he's just hurting. He never faced her death. He ran from it. He was in Europe when she died, and as soon as the funeral was over, he went back. Kanye has always been the type of person to say what he thinks. I don't judge him. As a matter of fact, I defend him. Okay, so then this next chapter is to his daughter, Amoye. I think one of the hardest things I've experienced is finding a way to balance my dreams with yours. I know I can be selfish. Because my dreams mean so much to me. I figure that once I attain my goals, I can take care of all my loved ones. But of course, there's no end. There's no stopping place. That's why I have to find the balance. You do have to find the balance. But now she's grown. He tells this weird story about crashing Oprah by accident. He thought Jamie Foxx invited him. And it turned out no one knew he was coming. But then Jamie Foxx still get him on TV. 
And he talks about some great trips he went on, which is always like, okay, buddy, we could wrap it up before we get to the listicles. Next to Cuba, I went to China. Okay. The Great Wall of China. He thought it was incredible. There you go. One more five-star review. He takes a quick moment to shit on reality stars. (laughs) He's like, that's not fame. And then it turns out at this point he was dating Serena, Serena Williams. And he talks about all the nice things he does for her, like buy her flowers and get her shoes she likes. They love the song Bubbly by Colby Calais, which is goofy to me. Yeah, this is my vision of marriage. It's the love that you share with another that enhances you both. You can become better students of God and children of the Lord. You can become better yous. I always forget that Serena Williams is a Jehovah's Witness. Me too. He's like, I got to learn more about that to find out what she'll be telling our kids. I'm like, yeah, look into it. Also, don't because I don't think you guys stick together much longer. And then he says this. I love this chapter because it makes me think about having all of those things, all the faith, all the hope, but with love still being the most important thing. Every time I read the passage, I understand something new within it. Spending time with my daughter, being in a loving relationship, being in nature, all those things are worthy of love. Then it ends with, recently I asked Amoye, what's the one thing that daddy said that he taught you that you remember the most? To be respectful, she said. She used to tell my mother that the reason she gives money to homeless people is that she's seen me do it all the time. I wanted to show her that it's a good to give. To be able to give is a beautiful thing. I wanted to know that. Amoye tells me I'm a good daddy. You treat people nice. More than anything, she's learned from me that treating people with respect is important. He loves to prop himself up. When he first got a record deal, him and his friends all jumped in the car to go somewhere else and he rode in the hatchback. And he was like, I knew that I was going to be the face of it, but they were all going to help me. So he like really writes about every time he does a nice thing for other people. And it really makes you wonder if this is all of them. He just feels very cloying. I wish I didn't have to hear him tell me what a nice guy he was. To so start a chapter with a letter to your daughter and end that chapter with being like, anyway, daughter, what do you love about me? <laughs> it's quite funny. And then finally, we get to the last chapter about his best friend and cousin who has also passed away. I mean, I do want to say that is one of the sad things. And I don't think it's ever addressed spot on how many people he's lost, but it really comes through in the book and it's heartbreaking. I mean, when he lost his cousin, he started to waver in his faith as well. It was really hard for him. And then he found it again and he got to go to the White House and meet Barack Obama. The rest of this is about how much he loves Barack Obama. He got to go to the White House. And of course, Fox News was like, vile rapper goes to the White House. And his friends were texting him being like, don't pay attention to what Fox News is saying. And he was like, I've never paid attention to what Fox News is saying. It was hard for his mom, though. But she's like, you know, I always said to him, consider the source. And she just was shocked. She goes, Sarah Palin, after all the mean things they said about your kids, did you ever consider that you were talking about my kid? And I was like, Dr. Hines, I do not actually think that Sarah Palin is as good a person as you are. (laughs) I really don't think that. He had a hard time getting ridiculed because this was silly. Like people were so mad at me and they pulled like two lyrics that weren't even that bad. And so then it just ends with meeting Dr. Maya Angelou. Here we are in a black church in Maryland creating art together. Jesse Jackson was there. So were Cornell West and many other familiar faces. And then it just ends with him kind of summing up what his purpose is. Like anyone in the entertainment industry, I want the attention and accolades. I want awards and recognition. But I know that my greater purpose goes beyond all of that. A long time ago, I made a conscious decision as an artist and a human being that I would strive to do things with purpose. From then on, my aim has been to inspire and raise consciousness. As I've grown, I've traveled. As I've broadened my views, I've begun to work for the betterment of all people. This is the story I've strived to tell you. This is where Rashid and Common become one. So his purpose overall is the betterment of people. I have to be honest. I didn't read the epilogue. I got to the end of this book and I go, I don't think you deserve it. He talks a lot about his purpose. His purpose is having a purpose. I guess I just like had high hopes for this book because he is literally a lyricist. Yeah. I know conscious rap isn't literally about like your own personal consciousness, But I did kind of expect more from him because he is like a conscious, considerate person who I feel like obviously if he had wanted to tell the story in an interesting way, he could have. If he wanted to go deep, he could have. I know he wouldn't have written it either way, but he's a writer by trade. I felt the same disappointment that I felt in like comedians when their book aren't that good. I'm just like, this is your livelihood. All right, Heather Gay, of course we weren't going to get a good book out of her. Why would we have? But Common, when they came to you and said, why don't you write this book? And you said, I don't know. I think he literally says, when they came to me and said, why don't you write a book? I said, what would I write about? You could have told a great story in 10, 15 years when you really wanted to sit down and take a good whack at it. Yeah, I think that our best comparison for this book was Dave Grohl. Yeah, I called it exactly like Dave Grohl because it was all just like, and you know who else was in the studio? And you know who I opened for? It was like, I mean, if you're into rap and you love to see lists of rap names, I think if you are really interested in rap history, this would be a really bad book to read because I don't think he covers it that well. Me neither. I mean, he doesn't even explain his feud with Ice Cube in a way that you could even tell what side of it Ice Cube was on. I didn't get what the problem was. (laughs) 
I didn't understand what his lyrics were saying in a mean way. I just didn't pick up on the nuance of it all. But I thought Common was hot. <laughs> you know, I have really high standards for hot people. I will say, I think he has crazy eyes like me. He's got like that intensity and the cornea that I got. Do you know what I mean? That me and my dad have where like we smile and it's like. <sighs> yeah, I wonder if your eyeball ever got poked out and because that's why his, his healed intense. <laughs> Scar tissue in the eyes. Um, okay, any final thoughts, Ash? I wanted a little bit more from Common. I think he's like a fun, funny person. This book was weirdly serious, but also nothing. There were a couple funny moments. In Chicago, a lot of people have a Common story. I don't, but people would always just be like, oh my God, you'll never believe who I b- bowled with last night. Common. I believe that. He does seem like a guy. Like He's like, after my fourth album, I was having a beer on the stoop with my friend. I like that about him. I think I like him. I think if I met him, I'd love to bowl with him. I think that's yes. the perfect activity. I bet he's charming. I did feel that this book was a bit, let me tell you about all my good things. I don't know. It just wasn't a great book. Someone wanted him to make a book and he thought, this is the version of me that I wish to portray. It's like a bad reality show when someone won't be themselves at all because they're afraid of the version that will get put on TV. He like isn't being himself. And let me tell you something, Common. You're never going to be in the NBA. Being the son of a man who's 6'8", that is impressive. That is really impressive. So good for you. Shout out to Lonnie Lynn. (laughs) All right. We love you guys. Bye. Bye. And shout out to the real star of this book, Dr. Hines. Oh, my God. I, I would read that book.